invite you now to turn with me in your scriptures to the gospel or to the reading of the scriptures from the New Covenant. Uh, from 1 Peter chapter 2, I'll begin with verse 9. Listen as the word of God is spoken and revealed to you this morning. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. My friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. So for the past many years, I have had a question on my mind. Uh, it's a question I've asked many of you in this room. Uh, it's a question I've asked fellow pastors here in Florida, uh, the Florida Annual Conference, and around our country. Uh, I've asked pastors in different denominations. I've asked people of a different faith tradition or perhaps even folks who don't have uh, a faith that they would claim. Uh, and the question is this. What is the mission of the church? What is the mission of the church? Or another way to say it is, how, to, how are we on mission together? How do we do it? What does that look like? What does that mean? So a few years ago, I had this experience in my last year of seminary. Uh, while we're there, we have to do a variety of internships or uh, field education experiences. You know, like a good preacher, why use one word when you could use three, right? <laughs> and so while I was in seminary, I had a lot of great opportunities. I was able to go uh, and uh, learn at a large church up in Michigan, right outside of Detroit, uh, I was able to work at a small country church in Hillsboro, North Carolina. Uh, I spent a summer as a chaplain at Duke Hospital. Uh, and so my last year, right before we got assigned our placements, I went in, spoke to the person that made the decision. And I said, I have a request. Uh, would you please send me anywhere but a local church? And he looked at me and he said, you know you're in seminary, right? Like, you're here to learn how to go pastor a local church. And I said, yes, yes, I do. Hear me out, though. Uh, I said, I figured for the next 40, hopefully more years of my life and my career, I'll be serving as a pastor at a local church. And this is the last chance I'll have to go and do something new, something different, something I've never uh, done before, might not have a chance to do again. And he, he paused for a moment, and then he, he had a little smile. He said, I know just the place for you. Well, a few weeks go by, and I'm anxiously awaiting the email to figure out uh, where I'm going to be sent to serve my last year's seminary. And finally, at 5 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, you hear that glorious email sound on your phone, and I open it up, and it said, congratulations, Robert, you are being sent to world relief. And your reaction to my story is the reaction I had. What is world relief? And why am I being sent there? Why is this the right thing? Well, it turns out that World Relief is an international nonprofit and a refugee resettlement agency. Uh, and their mission and their values, I wanted to share them with you because they connect so well. Their mission is to empower the local church to serve the most vulnerable. And to do so, their vision is to be in community with the local church. They want to partner with churches. And their values as an organization, they want to envision and change the most vulnerable people economically, socially, and spiritually. And as a part of my internship, I had experiences I never thought I would be able to have before. I was able to drive to the Raleigh-Durham Airport, a place I had been many times, but instead I was taking a husband who had not seen his wife and children in over a decade, and they were going to be reunited. Families who were fleeing uh, persecution and war and violence to come to a safe place 
I was able to be there and to reintroduce them. And then after we picked them up, I got to take them in a car. Some of them, it was their very first time in a car, uh, much less a car with air conditioning. Uh, And they were terrified when it started blowing cold air on them in hot North Carolina. Uh, And I was like, no, really, you will learn to love this stuff. Uh, And then I'd take them to their very first apartment or the first real home they had had in quite some time. And I'd I'd give them their keys and I'd give them a tour of their apartment. I'd have to explain things like, this is how you flush a toilet or don't stick your hand in the garbage disposal or there's hot water here, right? Those are things that all of us would say, of course. But for, for some of these people that I was interacting with and meeting, they had never seen anything like that. They never experienced anything like that. And it was from my time at World Relief that my, uh, my vision of how I saw the mission of the church transformed dramatically. The mission of the church was no longer just about my church or just about me and what I was doing to serve Jesus Christ, but rather the mission of the church grew into something incredible. You see, when I was growing up, I grew up in the United Methodist Church, and I thank my parents every week for forcing me to go with them growing up uh, because it taught me so many things and it allowed me to be here today. Uh, But growing up, I always thought the mission of the church meant uh, if we're involved in our community, if the community knows us for our service and our actions, uh, then that's good. We've done our part. We're a missionally engaged church. But what I've come to learn is that the mission is much more than that. The mission begins with ourselves. It's personal. The mission is also local, and that includes our church and our community. But the mission of the church is also global. It's three parts. It has three different pieces that work together to become one. It's a lot like the body of Christ. Now, the church itself, what we're doing here today, is a wonderful thing. It's a time for uh, folks to come together to be reaffirmed in what they uh, believe, to perhaps learn something new, to inspire, to go out, uh, and to make a difference. But rather, for folks who have been coming to church for a long time or would consider themselves spiritually mature, going to church is not enough. But if we continue to water the seeds that have been planted in our hearts throughout the lives, uh, when that grows, it changes what we think the mission is. It uproots the landscape of our hearts and our minds, and we see how much there really is to do as the church. The church is personal right here. It's local right here. And it's global everywhere else. So I want to give, I want to explain a little bit more about what the personal aspect of the mission looks like, and I'll invite you to follow along on the screen here. Uh, The mission of the church is to know Jesus Christ and to bear the fruit of his spirit. We've been talking a lot about spiritual gifts and the fruits of the spirit lately. Uh, And we only truly love in the agape way when we first grasp how he demonstrated his love, Jesus' love, for us. By forgiving us of all of our sins, by freeing us from the impossible standard of the law, and by giving us a brand new identity in him. Once we see the glory of the new covenant, that the new covenant promises us, we can transmit his love to the world around us. Being on mission together starts with us. It starts with our one-on-one relationship with Christ and pouring into that and falling more and more in love with Jesus each and every day. And as that grows and you become more confident in your faith and you're more assured uh, that the mission grows more and it becomes more about a local perspective. And we've got this up here on the screen as well. Uh, It says that God has got God's covenant people, all of us, right here on planet Earth. Uh, He's given us a glorious task, that we're to proclaim Jesus' name, that we're to talk about his sacrifice on the cross, his resurrection, and by living a spirit-filled life. We want the Holy Spirit to dwell among us. And then as we do so, we're able to grow in Jesus' own love and mercy and justice towards one another. We start to get in the community piece of mission and then to the nations, all for the sake of sharing about God's glory. 
And the good news is, is this task might seem overwhelming or too much for one of us to do on our own, but God has given us all of the tools we need to accomplish this mission. You see, Jesus has authorized gatherings of two or more people. When they come together, he says, I will be there with you also. So those gatherings of two or more people, they're like outposts of the kingdom. Another way to say that is the church. Have you ever thought of our church, Cypress Lake United Methodist Church, as an outpost of the kingdom here on earth? Kind of makes me want to stand up a little straighter, huh? We're an outpost of the kingdom. God is calling us to be on mission together. We're to encourage one another. We're to love one another. We're to spur one another on to do good works, to do good deeds for those that we know and care, and even those we don't know. So being on mission together means we need the church. In the last part, we talked about mission. We talked about mission uh, has a global component, and for that, we draw directly from Scripture. In the Gospel of Matthew, one of the last things that Jesus says uh, in that, starting in verse 18, it says this. You've heard it before. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Being on mission together means that we go out. We go to places of the world who don't know the name and the story of Jesus, and we tell them about it and we love them as we love ourselves. Being on mission is personal, it's local, and it's global. You see, some have said that perhaps the greatest heresy of religion uh, is that religion is some kind of a private affair between me and God and no one else. Perhaps you think that uh, faith with Jesus could be practiced by taking a long walk through the woods and thinking to yourself or sitting in your study and reading and having all of these wonderful and theological thoughts. But Christianity isn't that religion. Rather, Christianity is a group thing. It's something we are called to do together. When Jesus came, he didn't pick a bunch of isolated individuals and say, you do this and you do this and you do this. But what did he do? He called disciples. He called a group of people to come together around a shared mission. They had the same vision and the same values to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. And their mission was to create a church, a place where people could come to worship Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit. And in the New Testament, we read, uh, there's the Greek word for church. It's called ekklesia. Can you all say ekklesia? Ekklesia. Now you can go home and tell your friends you learned a Greek word at church today. I learned ekklesia. So ekklesia literally means assembly or congregation. So what are we? We're an ekklesia. Uh, And it's great because if you translate that word directly, it means called out. A congregation, an ecclesia, a church, an assembly, it means called out. Or God is calling the people of the church out. You see, and I think something we often forget is that the church was not our idea. The church was God's idea. God preserves the church and grows the church because that is what God's uh, view for the world and the kingdom is. It doesn't exist because us Christians continue to work hard. It doesn't exist because us Christians have always made the right choices or we've done the right thing. But rather, we believe that there's no such thing as a second generation Christian. But rather, God calls out new leaders and people in every generation to lead the church, to support the church, to be on mission together with the church. And I believe that. And I believe that God has called each and every person here today by name to be in this place, to partner with God in what God is already doing, to listen to God's voice and to start a new mission 
or a new ministry, but we need to be together. That's why God gave us this great gift of the church. And you might be thinking to yourself, I don't know if it's supposed to be, I don't know if God's actually calling me, but Jesus called ordinary people from the beginning of his ministry. He called fishermen and tax collectors to do extraordinary things. All throughout scripture, God called the most unlikely of people to do the most extraordinary and world-changing things. When we say to God, here I am, use me. I'm ready to be on mission with you. God will use us in a new and a mighty and a powerful way. These past few weeks as we've been talking about uh, loving like Jesus in a fractured world, and today we're talking about what it means to be on mission, uh, we know that we are in a very controversial and challenging time within the life of our beloved United Methodist Church. As Pastor Tom mentioned, right now the opening worship service is happening uh, in St. Louis where 864 delegates of, of United Methodist churches around the world, half clergy and half laity, are there uh, to debate, to have conversation about uh, members of the LGBTQ community uh, being able to be married in our churches, being able to uh, be pastors in our congregations. Uh, and that is a conversation that's been going on for a very long time, and it's been very harmful for many people who share our pews here and around the world. It's a hard time. It's a challenging time. But yet I believe God is still calling us to be on mission together. If you're new to the church, you probably know the church is not free from its disagreements or its fights. Uh, if you've been in the church for a long time or you know anything about church history, uh, you know we have had some pretty excellent fights and feuds. Some might even call them squabbles. And the reality is the church has looked pretty pitiful at times. And there's a lot of parts of our history that we wish we could do over again. Yet despite our shortcomings, despite where we know we didn't do what we were called to do, Jesus still calls us to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Two things we could not survive without. You see, the word ecclesia reminds us that the church has not only been called, but called out. And that makes me believe that we are God's called out people. And why do I believe that? Why do I so firmly uh, agree with that statement? <laughs> well, folks, that might be the end for me. I don't know. You know, this was going to be the sermon I submitted for ordination. Not anymore. <laughs> what can you do? Let's go back to the Word of God. That's where I was headed to, I promise. It wasn't some point. All right, let's go back and read that passage from 1 Peter we heard this morning. And this is from 1 Peter, the second chapter. It says this, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you might proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The man who wrote this, a first century writer, wrote this to his congregation, his ecclesia, recognizing that there were things wrong in the church, there were things wrong with the people in the church, but yet he told them, and we still believe it today, that we're all called to be a royal priesthood. In our church, we believe in this thing called the priesthood of all believers, that rather God is calling us each to be in ministry. God has called us by name and given us the gifts to do different things together in Christ. Because after all, what does a priest do? A priest mediates between God and the world. 
And that's what we're called to do as well. A priest uh, deals in things that are holy or set apart for God's use. And when we accepted Christ into our hearts, we allowed the Holy Spirit to dwell among us. We became holy. We became God's called out people. And so how do we be on mission together, knowing all of those things? Well, believe it or not, we have a plan. We have a plan of how we're going to do that as the people, the ecclesia called Cypress Lake United Methodist Church. So I want you to go ahead and grab your bulletin, and inside is our teaching notes or the little insert in there. Uh, we've put together a little fill-in-the-blank game for us this week, and the good news is, is everybody's going to get 100. I'm going to tell you the answers, and it's going to be so much fun. And how we are on mission together is by living into what our mission statement is here at Cypress Lake United Methodist Church. Uh, and so I want to share that with you, and I want to give you the answers for that fill in the blank. Uh, so our mission is this, to love God, to grow as disciples and serve others. To love God, to grow as disciples and serve others. That's the mission of our church. And how do we live out the mission? Well, we, we, we govern our lives by the vision of our church. And our vision is this, radiating God's love here, there, and everywhere. Personal, local, global. And the next question comes, well, we know those two things, but how do we really live that out? If you really want us to go out these doors and be on mission together, how do we do that? Well, our church has a set of core values, and it calls for us to reprioritize and reorganize what we do and how we govern our lives so we can reflect our vision and accomplish our mission. Uh, so I'll give you the first word for each of those core values on your teaching notes. Uh, the first is to welcome all people and inspire them to connect to a perfect God by centering their lives on Christ. We welcome all people. Next, we nurture one another in Christian community. We nurture one another. We care for one another. Uh, next, we challenge one another to intentionally grow as we journey towards becoming fully devoted disciples of Christ. It's a lifelong journey of faith we're on. We challenge one another. Next, we equip the church to fulfill God's call through strategic team-based ministries. There's that idea of community or needing one another again. Uh, next, we empower the next generation to lead, uh, and we definitely believe in this one. Uh, we've got a lot of the next generation here in the room up there. Can I hear from them in the back? <laughs> See, there they are. They're here. We empower the next generation. We care about those who are coming up to take our place. Uh, next, we go. We go into Fort Myers with the world of, with fresh expressions of God's love, reaching people that do not know God. Next, and lastly, we celebrate. We celebrate what God is doing in lives and community. We have to have fun. We have to care about one another. We have to love one another. We have to celebrate the good things that God is doing through us individually and as a church. And when you walk into our lobby, you'll notice that our mission and our vision are on the walls out in this main area. I encourage you to read them when you come in and take them with you when you go out. I want to challenge you to memorize them. So when you have a conversation with someone and you say, uh, what is your church about? You could tell them, this is our mission and this is our vision. And if you really want extra credit, you can memorize the core values too. <laughs> but in a time where our church begins or has felt a little more uh, marginalized or pushed to the side that we are no longer the majority, but perhaps we're becoming a minority, I wonder if this is the perfect time for us to reclaim our identity as the church, as the ecclesia, as God's called out people on mission together. See, church is a reminder that if we are to truly uh, live in the world, we're to be different from the world if we are truly to be for the world. So let us strive for unity 
and to be on mission together. Let's pray together. Oh God, we thank you for the gift of calling us out, for calling us your people and for allowing us the privilege to be an outpost of the kingdom that carries forth your mission here, there, and everywhere. God, we thank you that you continue to inspire us and move on us in a new and mighty way each and every day. And all of